Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? And now the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ the Lord is risen able please stand and join us in our gathering song open up the heavens sure, you know this song. <laughs> all right
heavens. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, Up From the Grave He Arose. Join me for our call to worship. Creator God and Lord of life, you who call forth from the darkness of death all those who love you. We rejoice on this Easter Sunday in the resurrection from the dead of our Lord Jesus Christ. Give us the capacity to taste the richness of the love you give us. Help us to experience the resurrection anew with open wonder and an increasing ability to see you in our lives. May our stones be rolled away today. In the name of Jesus, the risen Son, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Be seated. As our friends are coming up to share their special talents with us, uh, if you look in your bulletin, if you had a bulletin or one's near you, um, you can fill this out if you want us to get in contact with you. If you want to join our weekly email list of all the events and things that we're doing. You're free to welcome. Take that, fill that out, and put it in the plate back there on the back wall. Well, by now, you should know the words to this song. <laughs> We've been singing this for a hundred years. No, 80. 80, okay, 80. My mistake. Am I on? <laughs> yeah, okay. Jerusalem. Sing along anytime. Saw a 
city that got a glimpse of the golden throne. Tell me all about it. What will it be? I want to go to that city he saw, New Jerusalem. Jerusalem, I want to walk your streets that are golden. And I want to run where the angels have trod. to rest on the banks of your river in that city the city of God John saw the lion lay down by the lamb I want to know everything about did not see night the lamb of god well must be the light he saw the saints worship the great i am crying worthy worthy is the lamb i want to go to that city he saw new jerusalem streets that are golden and I want to run where the angels have trod Jerusalem I want to rest on the banks of your river in that city the city of God part a sing Jerusalem Jerusalem sing for the night is all Hosanna in the heart
come to the time where we prepare our hearts for worship with a reading of songs. And today, our reading of Psalm 16. Keep me safe, O God, for I have come to you for refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my master. Every good thing I have comes from you. The godly people in the land are my true heroes, and I take pleasure in them. Troubles multiply for those who chase after other gods. I will not take part in their sacrifices of blood or even speak the names of their gods. Lord, you alone are my inheritance, my cup of blessing. You guard all that is mine. The land you have given me is a pleasant land. What a wonderful inheritance. I will bless the Lord who guides me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. No wonder my heart is glad, and I rejoice. My body rests in safety, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life, granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Amen. And so with that, we come to our time of sharing together and praying together. I want to welcome our friends that are online worshiping with us this morning. If you have a prayer request, you can put it in the comments, and we will make sure that we can continue to add you to our prayer list. Oh, we just found out this morning over at Sunrise Service that um, my little great-granddaughter Charlotte down in Florida has been in the hospital two days, and they finally found she had a seizure while she was there, and they were able to monitor her. And she does have epilepsy. It's on the left side of her brain, and they're going to be running an MRI to see what's causing it and so forth. So just keep little Charlotte hearing in your prayers. Oh, I just found out this morning from a friend that um, um, one of our coworkers at work, his name's Herb McPherson, was just diagnosed with stage four lung cancer, and it's already metastasized to several different areas in his body. So just keep him and his family um, in your prayers, prayers, please. Um, just one prayer for... Uh... Todd Lockwood, uh, he lives here in DeGraff. He uh, told us uh, this Friday that he went in for some testing and for heart and then could possibly have some lung cancer or something, but he's getting his tests here this next week. Uh, just keep him in our prayers. And then also uh, Tom Armagast, uh, Ken and uh, Amy's father, uh, he went, had a hip transplant a few years ago, but somehow he got some bacteria infections and it went to his heart. And so he's down at OSU right now uh, with some heart issues down there that they got to do uh, some work on him this week, but not doing too good. So keep him. What was his name again? Uh, t uh, Tom Armagast. Just to let you know that Ros Roslyn Estep is home. She was discharged Friday, and um, she's recouping, and she could still use your prayers. We'd like to ask for prayers for our dad, um, Terry Heath. Um, I don't know. There's some people that do know, some people that don't. Uh, dad got uh, diagnosed with esophageal cancer, and um, he, he's um, very lucky. It's not metastasized anywhere else. Um, we found it early, 
So um, he's going to be starting uh, rounds of radiation and chemotherapy, and uh, then they'll look at surgery. But uh, we would just appreciate your prayers. He's all of us uh, positive thoughts, positive prayers, and everything will be fixed, and he'll be back fishing. <laughs> We'd also like to thank God for blessings today. We have, uh, I have three. Um, <laughs> I can't even think what I was going to say. <laughs> sure. Well, three generations. I have three gen. That's the word. I have three generations here this morning, and my wife has four generations. So. sitting there and if you look just right that that bookshelf behind him it looks like he's holding his hand up when you're, when you're scanning the crowd you're not looking for a bookshelf and all of a sudden you see this guy who's sitting over here going like this he keeps sitting there so I mean maybe it is well, pray for the unknowns in, in your life Orville Whatever it might be. If that's all we have this morning, let's, uh, let's come together and go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Gracious and loving God, you have continued to provide for us. You have continued to bless and, and cover our lives with so much that even in the midst of what can sometimes seem like turmoil and circumstance, somehow you just appear. And there you are loving us through people and through things that we never expected. It's incredible for us to be together in a house of worship on this Easter morning, how we remember the resurrection, the new life given to us by your son, Jesus. His grace and his love carrying him to, to spill out his blood in new covenant form that we would be made sons and daughters of yours, God. We would have a chance at a right relationship with you, not because we've done enough things on the list, not because we've uh, incurred enough debt, but because you, God, loved us first and chose to die for us. The Lamb of God, Jesus, was our gift. He was our Passover. He is our eternity. Because of Jesus, who now sits at your right hand, he intercedes on our behalf. And so when we speak, it's not because of our goodness or lack thereof. It's not because of the things that we've done or lack thereof. It's because of who he is that allows him to speak to us. We share this dialogue now, this relationship. You've heard us speaking this morning and you've heard us aloud. Uh, you know about what's happening with Charlotte. And we pray that you'll be with Danny and Justin uh, as they go through with the steps that come next after finding out that Charlotte has epilepsy. God, there's so many people that have cancer or are dealing with cancer. We pray for coworkers who have lung cancer. The healing that needs to take place for, for Todd Lockwood and Tom Armagast, for Roz Estep and her, her injuries that are recoverable, but going to be a pain for a while. And of course, we pray that you would be with Terry Heath and his family as they go through treatment. And hopefully it's early enough and 
prayerfully, God, you are the God who you say you are, and in Jesus' name, we can pray that these folks will heal and get better. And God, we give you praise this morning for things that sometimes don't make sense, but praise you for generations being able to get together and be together. And praise you for little voices that are making a lot of noise, and we love it because they're here with us and with you. Even really tiny little noises. And we thank you for just allowing us to come together in freedom to worship, to love each other and be community together and care for each other in a place when in some countries, even right now, they're not even allowed to speak your name. We have a lot of freedom. And God, there's probably a hundred other things that we wanted to say this morning, uh, things that we don't need to say out loud, uh, things that we know we can take to you directly in conversation. And so in this time of silence, God, we address you directly with our confessions, our hurts, our hopes, and our dreams. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. Hear every one of those thoughts that are on our hearts. Hear us as we confess and get closer and closer and closer to you. Hear us as we ask for strength. And we don't seem to have any more left. Hear us when we are trying to figure out why we still believe. and We need to find out why. Hear us in our doubts. Hear us in our struggles. Hear us as we battle the forces of wickedness in this world as they're constantly trying to distract us. Give us some hope today that in celebrating this, the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, that we can be brought back to life with you. This Jesus taught us that we should love each other and care for each other. And his last great commandment was love one another the way I first loved you. And that means sometimes we have to hang ourselves on a cross. We have to serve. This Jesus also taught us how we should pray to you, God. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Now I think our choir is even going to share some special music with you.
Was that like a teaser? Is that, what that was? Is that what they call that? Now I have somebody that wants to share the reading of scripture with you today. Well, she may not want to, but she's going to. She agreed to. verses 1 through 12. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, carrying the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb. So they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled about this. Then suddenly two men in bright, shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the women bowed down to the ground on the as the men said to them, why are you looking among the dead for one who is alive? He is not here, he has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee? The son of man must be handed over to sinful men, be crucified and three days later rise to life. Then the women remembered that his words returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven disciples and all the rest. The women were Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James. They and the other women with them told these things to the apostles. But the apostles thought that what the women said was nonsense, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. He bent down and saw the grave cloths but nothing else. Then he went back home, amazed at what had happened. Here ends the reading. Thank you, Connie. Now there was a point to all that. I'll get there. How was your week? Was it good? But there's a chance it might snow this week, so Larry, you might have mowed too soon. Maybe. I don't know. There's a bunch of people in my neighborhood mowing yards, so good luck. We'll see how this goes. I know the, I know the conversation around the, uh, the breakfast table this morning was uh, about how last year at this time we were already planting, and now we're not, and it was a, it was a big thing. So cold has not been good. It's supposed to get warm eventually. Hopefully we are all handling life and working through whatever we work through. And I know for those of us who are here uh, on, on occasion, we are on mission this year. And so in all of our circumstances, I hope that we have been able to remain on mission. And that's worship, reflection, prayer, study, and serving. It's easy for us to take those five things and figure out how we are doing and how it's working with us and God. Typically, you'll find out one of those areas is lacking or one of those areas is weak. That's when we're having trouble in life, and hopefully, you can address it. Uh, First and foremost, I I said I would address this, and Connie uh, agreed to, uh, to volunteer and read today's scripture. And one of the reasons I wanted that to be read Uh, by a woman is because of what they mean in this passage. If we hadn't had Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and I believe it's in the book of Matthew, um, uh, the mother of John Solome uh, was also there. Depends on which gospel reading and retelling of this story. It's always the women who are taking the news of the risen Jesus back to everyone else. So whenever you think that women don't have a place in ministry, remember that if it wasn't for women, we wouldn't even know that Jesus was alive. It's true. That's where it started. So have you ever, uh, have you ever gotten a gift that has been uh, repeated? Like maybe you had like an aunt or, or a grandparent and every year they knitted you a hat. Maybe you always had that one relative that, that thought you always needed 
insert that one thing that you always got from them as a gift. I remember um, where I worked, and I'm probably going to let everybody will figure out where I used to work when I say this, but I remember where I used to work, every Christmas you'd get a tin, and it would have candy and nuts and stuff in it. And I also remember though over the years that, that that gift has gotten a little less and a little less. And it used to be a fancy tin. Then it was a smaller tin. Then it was a plastic thing. And so each year it just gets to be overlooked. By the time uh, I got to the end of my tenure, sometimes you'd, you'd, you'd actually take it home. Sometimes you wouldn't. Sometimes you'd eat it. Sometimes it would just get thrown away. And it always amazed me when you see somebody's face who's like a new hire or they just came in and they get this thing. Like they're not even used to having an employer that gives them a gift. And they look at it and they're like, oh, oh, oh look at this. And I were like, yeah, whatever. You'll get used to it after a while. Somehow I feel like Easter has kind of become that gift. It's repeated every year. A year from now, we're going to do this again, right? And it's just like, it's Easter. Yeah, okay, it's Easter. And we feel like sometimes we get too used to it. We go through the motions, and it's just kind of, yeah, it is what it is. Easter is just one of those days. And I often wonder what it is about Easter that could make us enjoy it afresh, bring it back some way new, that man, maybe this year I wouldn't just treat it as, well, here's Easter again. I mean, what if we had, what if we had the same living with Jesus experience that the the apostles did? And and, and we could then recall that when he's dead and obviously now is very alive. I wish that we could feel that so that we could enjoy it more or appreciate it more. This morning in the text that we are using here from Luke, we're left with Peter who sees the empty tomb and then just goes home. That's weird, right? But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up, ran to the tomb, took a look, Stooping in, he peered in, saw the empty linen wrappings, then went home again, wondering what happened. How many of you typically go to a church service and you feel that way every time, right? You you go home and you're like, I don't know what that was, but uh, now I'm hungry, so it's time to eat lunch. How many of us have gone to church on an Easter Sunday morning and Really, we were all caught up in the arrangements for lunch. We were caught up in having to wear the right clothes. We were caught up in having to, to go back to work tomorrow when we're already thinking about it. And, and we're, we're not here. We're, we're somewhere else, and it's just Easter. It's whatever. And so we haven't experienced the risen Jesus. So my challenge for you this morning is to open yourself up to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is here. It's trying to speak just like it did to those men and those women thousands of years ago. Pause for a second, put life on hold, and let the Spirit speak to you. I'd like you to hear more of the story. Because what happens after Peter leaves is he's afraid. I'm imagining what Peter's thought process is likely like. He watched him get crucified beaten pretty badly, murdered in front of him, basically. They drug him off, and they buried him in in a borrowed tomb. And now, even though he told me time and time and time again that he was going to rise from the dead, I had to go see it for myself, because now it looks like these, these guys that really didn't like him very much just opened this thing up and took his body. And if they are willing to go to that length to get rid of this guy... I'm out of here. We see, if we read later in the book of Luke, we see that Jesus appears to the two men walking on the road to Emmaus. And they don't even know it's him, so they're telling him, they're sharing the stories of Jesus to Jesus. And then they break bread together, they eat, they share a meal together, and their eyes are opened, and they're like, oh my goodness, it's you! How did we not know this? And so... Jesus tells him, okay, go ahead, 
and go tell everybody, I'll be there in a minute. And they come running in. Doors are locked at this point. These guys are huddled in, scared to death. Doors are locked. They are hiding. Any one of us could be next. We've all been there with him for three years. We all obviously look very much Galilean. They, I mean, they're going to come after us. About that time, guys, open up. They open the door and they begin to tell the story of interacting with Jesus, who's very much alive. Verses 35 through 40 says, Then the two from Emmaus told their story of how Jesus had appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they recognized him in the breaking of the bread. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself is suddenly standing there among them. Peace be with you, he said. But the whole group was startled and frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why are your hearts filled with doubt? Look at my hands, look at my feet. You can see that it's me. Touch me and make sure that I'm not a ghost. Because ghosts don't have bodies, and you could see that I do. And as he spoke, he showed them his hands and feet. What are you afraid of this morning? What is it? What's got you to a point where you're all anxious? What are you worried about? Are you really wishing that maybe you could have come here today and that this risen Jesus would, would miraculously make all your problems go away? Maybe make the bank account bigger. Maybe it would make the cancer go away. Maybe it would make you feel something, if anything, about this. Unfortunately, Jesus isn't here to make your problems go away. What he's here is to help you understand that you have nothing to fear and everything to gain. And Jesus, he came to save you from this world, not from the problems that are caused by it. See, we have this way of making Easter about the things that we've always done. Now, I'm not saying traditions are bad, but if you take a look around, it probably looks the same. Even my, even my Easter uniform is on properly today. We, and so we start to make it about the things that have always been done, the way they've always been done, and so it gets mundane. It gets washed out, and we forget that Jesus is still doing the things today that he was doing 2,000 years ago. We, we have had the privilege of living in a world where Jesus has already conquered sin and death. We have the scripture text to read them and understand them. And here was this group of people who lived it, and even they were afraid. But church, I have news for us this morning. That tomb is still empty. You can go to the tomb of any other prophet, any other great hero, other than Moses and Elijah, and they are going to be in their tomb. Jesus is not. We can look it up through ancient texts. We don't even have to look at the Holy Bible. We can find out there was a Jesus of Nazareth. There was a Jesus of Nazareth who faced trial under Pontius Pilate and was sentenced to crucifixion. We can find out from other ancient texts that this same Jesus had to be laid in a borrowed tomb from this guy named Joseph who was from Arimathea. And then we have more than 400 personal eyewitness accounts that saw this Jesus when he was dead. What are we waiting for? What's wrong with us? How is that not enough? Jesus came to bring dead things to life. That's what he does. That's what he's in the business of. He was literally the lamb that was to be slain on our behalf for the sins that we committed. So that we would be made together and whole with God again and made in right relationship with him. I want you to take a moment, and I want you to feel all the feelings that you're feeling. I want you to make sure and understand that there is nothing on your heart today that God has not walked with you or will not walk with you through. 
And all of it is because of this empty tomb. This Jesus is alive. And I know we're Methodists, but you can tell your voices if you want. Amen. Jesus is alive. He's worthy of our praise. And the tomb is empty. You know what else is empty? The cross is empty. You know what else was empty? All of those people who were at the, at the sight of their Savior, their best friend, watching him die. Their hearts were filled with grief and emptiness. And what God calls us to do today is to be empty. If we want to experience this, if we want to feel this, if we want to know this, we've got to get rid of all the stuff that we're holding on to. All the things that we're trying to make God to be, but he's not. And then we think badly of him because of that. We've got to dig deeper for that. Our hearts, our lives have to be emptied out if we're going to allow this risen Jesus to have a place to reside. Our tomb has to be empty if we expect his to be empty. We must be empty every day that Christ can rise within us. And I pray that today is the day where we come back to life, where we believe that this giant stone that couldn't have been rolled away by a few people was moved by God, that this God who wanted to have relationship with us so badly that he was willing to risk the life of his son for us. That's incredible. We must allow this Jesus to come in and be a part of our life if we can experience, if we want to, a wellspring of joy and peace and hope and love. And it fills us all the way up. Church, he is worthy and he's alive. Amen. Join me as we pray over our offering this morning. Gracious and loving Father, you have given to us, out of the goodness of who you are, the very breath of life. From the moment we are born, we will take a first breath, and we know that we will take a last one. And everything in between has been a gift from you. So God, our offering is to be giving it back to you, whatever it is. Whether it's our time, our energy, our talents, our gifts, and even our money. We give back to you because this is already yours. We're just using it. So God, take what we can give you, and we pray that you would multiply it, make it grow, because the world needs to know how much you love them and how much you gave up in the life of your son to show them that you love them. It is in Jesus' name that we have the opportunity to pray to you, God. Pray that your Holy Spirit be here with us, guiding and strengthening us. Amen. So now I'm not going to close with a regular hymn. Instead, and you may not know this song, but if you know it, I know you're going to be you're going to be all about it. But I'm going to ask you to stand. Let the Holy Spirit speak to your face and your heart and your voice, even if it's good or not good. Because it's time to get our dead bones back to life.
gather bone to bone, bone to bone. I looked, I looked, and flesh appeared on flesh appeared on them, and skin covered and skin covered them. But there was no breath, there was no breath in them. Then he said to then he said to me, prophesy, prophesy through the breath, prophesy, prophesy, son of man, sing to it, sing to it. So a survey was conducted April 3rd through the 4th in 2012. That's 10 years ago. 77% of Americans believed that Jesus rose from the dead. 86% believed that he was a real historic figure. I wonder how low those numbers would be right now if we do that again. And that's only been 10 years. What has happened? What has changed? If anything, what has changed is that people aren't believing in who this God is because they don't see the living Jesus in you. And when they don't see the living Jesus in you, there's no reason for them to believe in this God they can't see. It's time. It's time to come back, come back to life. Come alive, church. That's my hope for you this week. And as we start Easter celebration, let's come alive. Amen. Be blessed this week.